Up next, we have Rich Lander, Stephen Tube, and Jan Kotis, a.k.a. your favorite .NET music group, Rich and the Architects. And they're going to drop their debut album titled .NET 5 Runtime Deep, Five, Deep Dive. All right, gentlemen, go ahead and jump in. Here we go. Oh, wow. Uh, well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, so it's, it's Tobe, though, I think. Um, yeah. It is. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, totally. So let's do some intro. So I'm... Um, yeah, I'm Rich Lander. I'm a program manager on uh, the .NET team, working on the runtime and Docker and IoT and stuff like that. And I work with these two fine folks. I'll let them. How about Stephen go next? Uh, I'm Stephen Tobe. I work on the .NET team as well. Uh, in particular, I focus all, a lot of my time on our libraries. Uh, so kind of everything from CoreLib uh, up and sort of stopping around ASP.NET. <laughs> hey, and I'm Jan Kotas. Um, I'm another .NET architect. You know, I work right below Stephen. Uh, you know, from everything from Corel down. You know, GC, JIT, the kind of the type system, uh, and everything that comes with it. Yes, uh, that's true. So I think we had um, we had a list of four topics that we were going to talk about. So there's uh, no slides for uh, for our talk today. We're just going to have a conversation. And so they were um, ARM64, HTTP, Tech and Power, and um, Single File. So how about we start with um, ARM64? So um, let's see. Like the first thing to cover um, is how is ARM64 different than X64? Um, do you want to do you want to cover that one, Jan, and then we'll kind of go deeper from there? Uh, you know the the um, probably the biggest dif one of the biggest differences is, is memory model, where uh, you know the uh, the the way kind of the log free algorithms work uh, is different between uh, uh, Intel and ARM. Um, that's something that affects you know a lot of relatively a lot of code throughout the libraries because of the, uh, you know, there are a number of places that are optimized using log free algorithms. Um, when we look at, you know, at the lower levels of the stack, you know, ARM64 has different instruction set, obviously. So, you know, uh, we, need, we had to build that whole new chip uh, for it. Uh, and the new instruction set also uh, requires some specific optimizations that we didn't uh, have for Intel before or that do not even make sense for Intel. Uh, so we had done some of those too. Um, uh, From a kind of library's perspective as well, um, the, the set of sort of, you know, architect uh, architecture specific operations that are available um, yeah, they're similar across the various platforms, but they also differ in what you can actually call and how they work and exactly what they do. And so these are all serviced as a whole set of intrinsics that are available for C Sharp developers to call. And it's a completely different set from the ones that we previously made available for you know, X64. Um, yeah. Right. So may maybe this would be a good uh, jumping point to talk actually about hardware intrinsics. and. Kind of the distinction between like in 3.0, we had a functional ARM64 implementation, 3.x. Um, and then, you know, one of the things we tried to capture in the blog post today was that it's now a, a high performance, or at least the start of a high performance implementation for ARM64. So maybe it'd be good to characterize how we did that. But the, the hardware and the six are kind of uh, are interesting features. So, uh, I would like to step back a little bit and uh, say, you know, one of the principles we have in .NET since the very beginning is to be, give you low-level access when you need to, right? Uh, kind of basically that's where uh, unsafe C# -sharp comes from. That's where number of the uh, constructs that you use for interop that has been that has been in the .NET since the very first days, uh, you know, come come from the, they are basically motivated by this principle. Um, and so the hardware intrinsics are basically yet another feature in this 
that follows this principle. They are not for everybody, but you know, when somebody needs them to really optimize the code for the underlying uh, platform, they are available. Um, yeah, so uh, we originally we started with Intel Hardware Intrinsics. Um, so we saw the Hardware Intrinsics uh, um, uh, as, you know, as a kind of cheap way to get performance. Uh, so it, there are a lot of them and many of the algorithms in uh, unmanaged libraries or, you know, or in machine learning domains are getting optimized with them. So we saw it as a good opportunity. We started with Intel, uh, hardware engine six, uh, and you know, in .NET 5, we added an ARM64 hardware engine six as well. Um, yeah, kind of the way I think about hardware intrinsics is they like there's all these transistors on the chip that are that are dedicated to these extra instructions that we previously didn't use or didn't use much. And so these hardware intrinsics kind of give us access to another another gear like on a bike or a car. Uh, is, is that a fair analogy? Uh, yeah, I think that's perfect analogy. And to, to Jan's point about sort of exposing the kind of the you know the low level that you need to access there's sort of intermediate steps you, you write your basic for loop and you're not taking advantage of those extra transistors you were talking about and then you can opt to go a little bit lower down write a little bit more complicated code and use sort of the the vector uh types that exist where then the jit tries to sort of translate from that into whatever intrinsics are available whatever extension uh, operation sets are available. Um, and then be, that, and that gets you a certain degree further. And then when you really want to sort of hyper optimize for a particular set of uh, operations that are available, you can then dive even lower and go down to the intrinsics. And so you end up seeing um, code that looks like, you know, if this set is available, do this code. Else, if that set is available, do that code for the operations that you really want to uh, kind of make scream. And you can see that if you go and look at some of the core code, say in Corelib for operations on strings or spans, in some places you'll see vector just being used. And in other places you'll see if AVX2 is supported, else if SSE2 is supported and you know complete implementations for each uh, set. Right, so that 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 allows the, the product to light up on, on different hardware. So, uh, uh, you know, I, the, the we were talking about SIMD APIs there, so or which stands for uh, single instruction multiple data, um, and so the lowest one that we support is SCC two, uh, and we support up to AVX two, and there's two other instruction sets in the middle of those two, at least. Uh, yeah, that's for that's for Intel on ARM. Sorry, the, you're the, right. The name the, the names are different. Yes. Uh, Neon and SVE. Uh, yeah, those are not actually the names. I think we are using in the uh, in the uh, in the API surface. But yes, these are some of the names that kind of show up in there. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the hardware engineering things are actually you know pretty complex subject to master. Um, you know, I have mentioned on some of the PRs that were contributing uh, the. The, the implementations that one has to have PhD in hardware engineering six to be you know, to understand that and to uh, kind of validate that it's actually good implementation. But, but you know, when, when it works, it's uh, uh, it's significant improvement. So how about um, you know Apple had a, a big announcement today. They announced the um, their Mac uh, their M1 chip for the new Mac machines. Um, and so that is kind of an ARM64 chip underneath the covers, even though Apple isn't branding it that way. Um, will uh, our implementation um, just work as is? Um, meaning, I, I know there's some specific things we have to do for ARM. I'm not, I'm not sorry, Apple Silicon. I'm not talking about those, but just from a basic standpoint, um, did everything we do in 5.0 lead us into a good place for those those m1 chips that were announced today uh yes yeah, that's all the work that we have done in fio it will just light up light up on on apple silicon awesome that's good to hear okay maybe we should switch topics um 
Although actually it looks like we just got some feedback or a question. I think we kind of covered this at the, at the top, but let's just, if it, we can just cover our roles super quickly because someone asked what our job roles are. So I'm a program manager. So I, I write uh, specs and blog posts and, you know, try and make sure we're building the right thing for customers. Uh, I'm a dev or architect or whatever title you want to throw at it. Uh, I spend half my time um, writing code in particular focused on our libraries um, and um, half my time sort of overseeing uh, other the code that other people write in sort of the direction that, that we're heading. Uh, yeah, same, same for me. You know, another thing I would add is that I, I spend non-trivial amount of time just writing documents, you know, kind of that are uh, clarifying the direction or where we want to go and so on. You also spend non-trivial amount of time answering my questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next topic was HTTP. Um, this, this is a little closer to more Steven's wheelhouse. So I think a couple questions on this, you know, I think people understand what HTTP is, like we're actually using HTTP for this, this stream right now, anytime you're using the browser. And so I think there's really this landscape of, you know, HTTP 1.1 is kind of what a lot of people had been, were using up until very recently, which HTTP 2 coming, and then HTTP 3 is kind of on, on the horizon. And so what does that mean from a .NET developer standpoint, both from a client standpoint as well as a server side standpoint? Um, and, you know, will like ASP.NET core developers be well positioned, you know, to line up with the new browsers that are eventually going to come out for HTTP 3? And then what are we doing from a performance standpoint? So there's a whole bunch of questions there. Sure. Let's start taking those, Stephen. Yeah, so you know, HTTP 1.1, as you said, is sort of ubiquitous, right? It is the version of HTTP that everyone uses everywhere. Every version of .NET supports HTTP 1.1 or 1.0, whichever. Um, and um, and .NET 5 has a great implementation and, and has for a long time. Um, and it's it's almost completely in managed code implemented in C sharp on top of sockets. Um, in the last few years, HTTP two has emerged as uh, sort of the the cool thing for people to to utilize with HTTP. Um, and uh, in particular, it shows up in a variety of workloads. It shows up uh, as a great way for um, uh, browsers to reduce the number of open TCP connections they need to, to server. So you kind of um, reduce your, your resources that you're using. But then also for um, uh, protocols like gRPC, it's sort of the, the bedrock underneath gRPC. Um, and if you look at kind of the support we've had for HTTP2 and .NET, .NET Core 3.0, 3.1, both uh, client and server .NET had an implementation that worked. It was functional. Um, you could use HTTP2, you could use gRPC, um, but it wasn't sort of the most efficient thing out there. So we sort of jumped into the water, water was warm, come on in, you know, you, you can use HTTP2. But then in .NET 5, our implementation of HTTP2 gets a whole lot better again across client and server. If you look at some of the benchmarks that have been put out there um, for uh, gRPC, which is you know very much uh, fundamentally based in HTTP2, um, you see that um, it gets on the order of three or four X faster just by moving from uh, .NET Core 3.1 to .NET 5 and also getting updated uh, bits for our gRPC library. Um, and then also in .NET 5, now we've got you know a, a very um, high functioning HTTP 1.1 of great HTTP 2. We also have preview support for HTTP 3, which is the new kid on the block. Um, and uh, it it is again functional, but we haven't invested a whole lot in um, in performance. And when I say functional as well, like it's not even like in final release to spec form yet. The final HTTP 3 spec isn't even done at least not the last time i checked it's very 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 close so you know we'll for the next release of dotnet one of our goals is to both ensure that it meets whatever the final specification is and also have great performance and that's kind of been the trend that we've had is we can you know, make sure we have table stakes make sure the implementations are out there and then we can really invest in making them great uh that makes sense um so 
can you so it's pretty obvious what a server is supposed to do with respect to h or I, I guess i should back up so one of the the big um aspects of http2 and http3 is multiplexing you know this is the idea of that there's a, a kind of a duplex nature to it and um for a website that's pretty obvious like the the browser will ask for multiple resources at once and the web server will just do the right thing but from a client perspective like http client are there scenarios where that multiplexing duplex aspect is relevant that you expect to see? Sure. I mean, it certainly ends up having a, a large impact on servers because servers are dealing with a multitude of clients and they want to try and minimize the resources. Um, but for, uh, you know, it's often the case that clients are servers. Um, and so, you know, can take like a reverse proxy, for example, where you're not only dealing with your incoming connections, but you're making a whole lot of outgoing. The same kind of issues apply to both. But there are there are scenarios for this stuff even beyond performance. Um, uh, HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2 are both based around TCP. Um, uh, whereas HTTP 3 is based around uh, QUIC, which is based around UDP. Uh, and so new scenarios start to emerge with HTTP 3, for example, uh, making it really easy to transition across networks, for example, on a mobile device. Whereas if you tried to, you know, if you changed access points, you might lose your TCP connection, but with UDP and QUIC, in theory, you can just kind of transition seamlessly and pick up wherever you are. That makes sense. So what about, you know, you said that um, uh, at least for HTTP 2 and HTTP 1.1 that our networking stack is written or, or HTTP part of the networking stack is written in C sharp. And, you know, I think there probably still is this kind of idea that managed languages aren't quite up to the task for some of those low level, um, super performance sensitive um, components. So can you speak to why C sharp is a good choice for something like an HTTP stack? Sure. Uh, I mean, when it, you know, if, it, if it came to something that was pure CPU, raw computation, doing nothing but number crunching, um, it, in general, you can still eke out better performance if you really focus on, you know, pedal to the metal with your C and C++ code. Um, for everything else, you know, with, with networking and IO, it's a lot of just sort of shuffling bits and bytes around. And so the, you're, you're not dealing with getting the, you know, the maximum number of instructions per cycle. You're dealing with um, you know, copying data from here to there. You're dealing with how can I um, express my operations as simply as possible and, you know, allow um, more experimentation to be done that allows your code to iterate faster. So uh, I, I actually wrote about this. I had a blog post about performance improvements in .NET 5, and I kind of highlighted- You write those, right? I do write some of those, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I highlighted, which to me is one of the more interesting aspects of all the perf improvements we have, which is, you know, if you look at Jan's PRs, for example, a lot of his PRs in .NET 5 were rewriting code from C and C++ in the core CLR runtime and moving it to be in C sharp. Um, and there are a whole variety of reasons that one might want to do this, but it also has um, demonstrated to have non-trivial performance benefits uh, to doing so. Um, it, whether it be uh, making it easy for the garbage collector to do what it needs to do, uh, or whether it be minimizing transition costs between C sharp and C++ um, you know, interop costs. Um, so there are, you know, the, we're finding that there are a lot of benefits to having more and more of our code in C sharp. Um, and, and for something like our networking stack, um, the more we can have in uh, C sharp, the easier it is for us to guarantee that it will work well on whatever platforms we end up running totally. on. Uh, so Jan, do you have anything to, I think so we've got like 10 minutes left. Do you have anything to add on this this uh, native to C-sharp topic before we switch topics? Uh, yeah, you know, there, there are like uh, deep love to write everything in C-sharp, right? In fact, you know, we would love to rewrite the whole runtime, including Kijit and GC in C-sharp. Unfortunately, it's not practical to do so. So we have to be kind of, um, uh, thought, thoughtful about where we where we spent our energy, and um, actually, when you look at the current state of the Quick Protocol, 
we have uh, we have basically several implementations that are in flight right now. One is uh, based on unmanaged uh, quick library uh, that all starts to make things working and you know functional. But in parallel, we are also uh, doing uh, uh, managed implementation that's basically you know rewriting that's basically a rewrite of that uh, logic in C sharp that we hope to. Uh, get some of the benefits that Stephen talked about from. And, and one additional benefit on that front is anytime we sort of eat our own dog food, anytime we build stuff on top of our own stuff, we end up driving improvements into our own things that are that the, the APIs are layered on top of. And if you look at previous releases of .NET, you'll see we've invested pretty heavily in improving sort of the TCP focused operations we have in our networking stack, but the UDP focused uh, operations have haven't seen as much investment and so by building a managed quick implementation uh, we're very quickly finding deficiencies that we'll go and fix uh, and then those will also benefit everyone else using udp yeah totally it, you know i think one distinction there is that it's not because we didn't care necessarily before it's just this is providing us access to information that we literally didn't have yeah no one complained and uh we didn't it didn't show up in our own benchmarks until we started using it heavily and then it showed up on our own benchmarks yeah it, exactly so i don't want to spend too much time on this particular topic but i would like to talk a little bit about tech empower scott talked about it in the keynote today and we've been talking about it for many years and so one of the things that i really noted is scott said that you know the the three one rankings were already pretty good um as i think you you two both know but then he said there's double digit improvements for um, 5.0. And I think he said there was like a 42% improvement or something like that for plain text, which is hard to believe. And like how, how much is possible that's still left after these 5.0 improvements? So plain text, which is sort of the, the benchmark we've gone after for years in ASP.NET didn't, uh, didn't actually go by, grow by 40%. Um, uh, it, we, we were sort of, amongst the top five or 10 in the rankings, and they're all um, you know, hitting the network bandwidth limitations. And so they're all within you know, 7 million requests per second, plus or minus 1,000 requests per second across all the, the, um, all the, the rankings. But where we did see 40, 40 plus percent growth was in two other benchmarks. Okay, I um, must have mixed them up. No, it's fine. Uh, where we hadn't really focused on them in previous releases. And so we took the opportunity to sort of, I think, you know, maxed out we were going to be with plain text on the current hardware and turned our attention to these two other ones, one of the which is um, called the JSON serialization benchmark, which doesn't actually do that much JSON serialization. Uh, and then another one, which is called Fortunes, which is really about database access. Um, and they have, you know, um, very different patterns to the workloads uh, and exercise the networking stack and other areas of the stack in very different ways. And so by focusing on those, we maintained where we were on plain text and also kind of, you know, raised all boats uh, for, for these other two as well. Okay, that explains it. So it's a bit like the UDP example again, which is we just spent more focus on something. Yeah. Okay, we probably just have a few minutes left, and I want to talk a little bit about single file, which is a uh, you know, topic that's closer to, to Jan. So, you know, my understanding of, of this feature is, um, you know, the primary thing we were after was producing apps that were indeed a single file. That, that, that part's pretty obvious. And the primary approach we did, we took for that was... Um, we have this app host. This is the XE that you get for your, you know, you know, your .NET apps on all three operating systems. And we started statically linking the runtime into them. Is 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 that basically the story, Jan? Uh, yeah, that kind of uh, explains it, uh, you know, at high level. Um, I I think what's interesting to talk about the, uh, uh, about the single file is kind of the journey we are on. Uh, so when we are starting, uh, you know, the the, the, the .NET Core project, we were kind of bundling everything together, like, you know, single file and AOT and uh, IL linking uh, or IL trimming. Uh, and it, it, we kind of talk about it as one bundle and uh, of, and because of it was one bundle, it was also a very hard problem to solve. Uh, so what we have actually done, we have kind of decoupled all these different aspects and we are working on each of them 
uh, separately to some degree. So, uh, and the single file is basically one of them. So you can have single file apps without getting, uh, without any of the other, uh, you know, interesting technologies, or you can have single file with, uh, with them. And, you know, it's your choice, uh, uh, depending on, you know, what kind of app you are building. Okay. So a la carte. Uh, so there was some discussion, uh, you know, the last few blog posts, we've had some discussion about native AOT. Can you describe where we're, where we're at with that topic uh, and which repo it's being focused on? Yeah, so the, the native AOT is uh, kind of part of the journey. It's basically a, uh, kind of the interesting combination of all these technologies together that we believe will allow you to uh, hit uh, basically what you what one can achieve with statically compared languages you know in the ballpark uh it's not for everybody because of it uh, it has uh, each of each of these technologies whether it's single file or idle trimming comes with downsides uh it, it the downsides are in compatibility issues that you will hit not everybody not every library is compatible with uh, with them so if your application is building uh is is uh, just using the compatible libraries, you know, uh, and you are willing to uh, live with say longer build times to publish your app, you know, that might be interesting option. Um, and you know, as I said earlier, it's a hard problem. So we are actually running it as an experiment uh, that is not part of the uh, mainline .NET runtime repo. That's uh, uh, in a special report that we have set up just for these experiments uh, to kind of not uh, destabilize the mainline product. And once the experiments are ready and if they are successful, if they deliver the promise, then you know, we will look into uh, productizing them. Okay, maybe um, with the oh, yeah, Go there ahead. are actually a number of a number of uh, experiments in runtime lab. For example, the managed rewrite of the click protocol is also one of the experiments that are. That is being worked on there. So uh, that's uh, that's how we uh, establish kind of innovation pipeline. Uh, so with like one year ship cycle that we are on with .NET Core or .NET uh, five and going forward, uh, it's some of the some of the things we would like to do are impossible to to land within one year. So the runtime lab is our place to stage the stage these uh, innovations and you know. Uh, fold them into the product when they are ready. And it's also worth noting when we say we that we're not just referring to those of us at Microsoft. In particular, for example, the the managed quick implementation, the initial draft of it came from uh, a master student uh, who's working on it as a master's thesis. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, actually, the the thought, the question I was wanting to end with uh, for both of you is actually this 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 one that we're discussing, which is. Uh, not so much the mechanics, but like an experimentation oriented culture. Um, you know, I know ASP.NET actually is potentially a little bit uh, ahead of uh, the, the runtime and libraries team on that. Um, like they did Blazor that way. Um, .NET Monitor, which is actually in between the two teams actually is also an experiment. So maybe if you could just both say like, you know, 60 seconds worth on the experimentation culture, what it means to you and what you yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I, I definitely think that there's more that we can do. At the same time, being sort of lower in the stack, it's uh, it's a little bit more challenging to release sort of standalone experiments. Um, one thing we have been doing, though, is releasing sort of experiments as part of the release product under feature flags. Um, you know, turn you can turn them on with uh, an environment variable or something like that to experiment. Um, and you can see these uh, as, you know, as low as the JIT where various environment variables will turn on experimental features um, like escape analysis and stack allocation uh, for objects. And then you work your way up the stack and you find uh, experiments with how sockets behave and kind of trading off, experimenting with trading off performance and um, sort of uh, preventing developers from from you know, guardrails for, for developers using the APIs. Makes sense. Do you have anything you want to add on that, Jan? 
Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that having the culture that uh, encourages experiments on all different levels is very important. Um, uh, you know, what needs to come with that is uh, that we haven't always been good at is to explain like when we are talking about something, whether it's an experiment or whether it's very early experiment or whether it's experiment kind of close to ending or whether it's something that's absolutely going to be in the next release. Uh, that's something we need to be better at. That's uh, not something we have been always uh, good at explaining. Um, yeah, and the runtime lab is the new place to run our experiments. <laughs> uh, so no one's broken in yet to, to take us offline. So maybe I'll ask one more question on this topic is, uh, obviously, we the, like the like A/B testing for for websites is super common. Um, that's that's not feasible at all in the runtime in any real sense or the libraries. Uh, how do we collect the data to know how the experiment worked since we don't have a, a metric type system like A/B testing? Actually, I think. You, oh, go ahead, Jan. Uh, you can uh, the runtime lab is specifically set up to allow that the the runtime lab. Uh, engineering system will produce, uh, you know, the uh, runtime packs that you can use to publish self-contained apps. Uh, okay. So that way, you know, they, we uh, we expect to work with whoever's interested to uh, try it, you know, to collect the data. So. Okay, makes sense. Looks like we're about to get uh, yep kicked off. <laughs> we are going to come kick you out. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. I really uh, appreciate your time today. Uh, lots of good stuff. Uh, we want to give a quick shout out to uh, Mike. You guys uh, answered the question on .NET support for the Apple M1 chip. Uh, and so we wanted to let Mike uh, know that the, the support's there. And we'll thank him. We'll make sure he gets his prize. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not there yet. We're, right. we're in the process, but uh, along the way. That's good. That's good. And I'm sure everyone's going to be looking forward to that.